Welcome to uh, a deep dive into the mind of Marcus Aurelius. So we're going into his uh, personal reflections, meditations, specifically book 10 today. And you know what's fascinating about meditations? It's it's not just some ancient history lesson. It's um, right. It's packed with advice that's like shockingly relevant even now, centuries later. It's true. This is a guy who ruled an empire. Yeah. Yet he was grappling with the same things we are. Totally. Finding peace amidst chaos, figuring out what really matters. Like it's strangely comforting. You know? uh, absolutely. And that's where Stoicism comes in, this philosophy Aurelius followed. It's all about understanding what you can and cannot control and choosing how you react to everything life throws at you. Okay. So less freaking out, more thinking like an emperor. Yes. I can try that. What nuggets of wisdom did you pull out from book 10 for us to unpack today? Well, we'll be diving into how Aurelius viewed perspective, the importance of acceptance, and even this really intriguing bit about the illusion of novelty. Ooh, that last one has me intrigued already. <laughs> yeah. It's like, is anything really new in the world? But let's start at the beginning. What about this power of perspective? How does Aurelius view that? Right. So in passage 24, there's this beautiful image he uses. He talks about finding tranquility, whether you're in a bustling city or on top of a mountain, picturing a shepherd's lodge on the top of a hill, peaceful and isolated. It's like he's saying your environment doesn't dictate your inner peace. We might all dream of escaping to that mountaintop, but Aurelius is reminding us that true peace has to come from within. Exactly. And isn't that so relevant today? We often think if we could just change our external circumstances, we'd magically be less stressed, less anxious. Right. Aurelius is urging us to look inward instead. It's like you can be in the most tranquil setting imaginable, but if your mind is a whirlwind of worries, you're not really experiencing peace, are you? So how do we cultivate that inner peace Aurelius talks about? Well, that leads us to our next theme, this idea of acceptance, which he digs into in passage 26. And he uses a really down-to-earth analogy to explain it. Planting a seed. Oh, yes. The seed and food analogy. I love that one. It's such a simple but powerful way to think about the things we can and cannot control. Right. You can plant the seed, nurture it, give it water and sunlight, but ultimately you have to surrender control to nature. You can't force it to grow. And it's the same with so much in life. So instead of stressing about the outcome, trying to micromanage every little detail, yeah. we should focus on what we can control, our actions, our effort, and then trust the process, right? Exactly. He even takes it a step further with the food analogy. We eat food, but we don't obsess over every step of digestion, do we? We trust our bodies to do what they need to do. Can you imagine if we did? I'd be stuck thinking about my breakfast all day long. And that's kind of Aurelius's point. We get so caught up in worrying about things beyond our control that we forget to actually live. He'd want us to find freedom in accepting what is. This is already making me rethink my to-do list and it's only the first theme. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about perspective, acceptance. What about this illusion of novelty? That one really caught my attention. It's a fascinating concept and surprisingly relevant to our 24-7 news cycle world. In passage 27, Aurelius reflects on how history seems to repeat itself, how human behavior and patterns remain pretty consistent across time. It's like we're bombarded with breaking news every second. But if you take a step back, it's often the same human drama playing out just with different actors on a different stage. You've got it. He even uses examples from his own life, talking about the courts of past emperors like Hadrian and Antoninus Pius. Empires rose and fell, rulers came and went, but the underlying human stories, those remained remarkably consistent. So what's the takeaway for us today? Should we just ignore the news and assume we've seen it all before? Not quite. It's more about recognizing that while the details might change, the underlying human experience is pretty constant. We all experience joy, suffering, ambition, love. So it's not about like becoming indifferent to the world, right. but rather having that bigger picture perspective. Yeah. No matter how chaotic things seem, we can find comfort in knowing that humanity has faced challenges before and come out the other side. Right. We're part of something bigger than just this moment. Exactly. That perspective can be really grounding, you know? It helps us see beyond our immediate worries and tap into this shared well of human experience that stretches across time. It's like Aurelius is giving us permission to relax a little, to not get so worked up about every little thing. Okay, I like where this is going. So we're yeah. seeing a theme here, finding inner peace, accepting what we can't control. But Aurelius takes it a step further, right? He brings in this concept of Numbs or law mm -hmm. in passage 25. And I'll admit, this is where I started getting a little lost. Yeah. What exactly did he mean by law? Ah, uh, yes, noms. This one's key to understanding Stoicism as a whole. 
Aurelius wasn't just talking about Roman law here. He was referring to a much broader universal principle. The Stoics believed in a kind of natural order, a divine reason that governs everything that happens in the universe. They called this logos, but Mormos captures that sense of an underlying law guiding principle that dictates how everything unfolds. So, like a cosmic rule book. Yeah. But instead of a bunch of thou shalt nots, it's more about understanding how everything is connected and working together. You're getting the idea. And what's fascinating is that the Stoics believed true freedom, true happiness, comes from aligning ourselves with this law. That means accepting what happens, even the difficult stuff, as part of this grand interconnected web of existence. That sounds incredibly freeing, but also kind of daunting. I mean, how do you just accept everything that happens, especially when bad things happen? Well, it's not about becoming passive or indifferent to suffering. It's about recognizing that fighting against the natural order, against the reality of what is, often leads to more suffering. It's like trying to swim upstream against a raging current. Yes. You're just exhausting yourself and you're not getting anywhere. Precisely. The Stoics would say it's far more productive to accept the current, so to speak, and to find ways to navigate it skillfully. So give me a practical example. Let's say I miss my train. Do I just sit there and say, well, this is the law. I must accept my fate. That doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you missed your train. Instead of getting angry and frustrated, which you can't really control anyway, you choose to accept the situation. You take a deep breath and think, okay, what can I do now to make the most of this situation? Maybe you call ahead, get some work done while you wait, or simply use the time to practice some mindfulness. You're not denying the reality of the situation, but you are choosing how you respond to it. So it's about finding that space between what's happening out there and how I react to it in here. That's where I can make a choice. Exactly. And that's a really powerful distinction. You're not denying the reality of the situation. You're simply choosing to approach it with acceptance rather than resistance. The Stoics would say that's where true freedom lies in choosing your response. That is a powerful idea. And it's amazing to think that these concepts written almost 2000 years ago are still so relevant. There's a real timelessness to Aurelius's wisdom, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And I think it speaks to the enduring power of philosophy to help us navigate the complexities of being human, regardless of when or where we live. Aurelius was a Roman emperor, but he grappled with the same fundamental questions we all face. How to find peace, meaning, and a sense of purpose in a world that often feels chaotic and uncertain. It's like he was having a conversation, not just with history, but with us right now. Yeah. It's incredible how these ideas transcend time and culture. It really is. And that's what makes meditations so much more than just a historical document. Yeah. It's a source of practical wisdom that we can apply to our lives today, no matter what our background or beliefs might be. It's like having a wise friend, someone who's seen it all, offering guidance. And in this case, that friend happens to be a Roman emperor from centuries ago, which makes you think, if Marcus Aurelius were giving a TED talk today, what parts of modern life do you think he'd want to give a good stoic shake to? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think he'd be astounded by how much information we're bombarded with every day. The 2147 news cycle, social media, the constant pressure to be productive. It's overwhelming even for us, and we're used to it. I have a feeling Aurelius would be a big advocate for unplugging, for finding moments of quiet and stillness. Right. Remember that Shepherd's Lodge, something tells me Aurelius would be all about those digital detox retreats. Absolutely. And I think he'd also caution us against putting too much emphasis on external validation and material things. Remember, Stoicism emphasizes virtue and living in accordance with nature as the true sources of happiness. It's about finding contentment within, not chasing after the next shiny object. So instead of getting caught in that keeping up with the Joneses mentality, maybe Aurelius would suggest we focus on appreciating what we already have, being present in this moment, which now that we're talking about it, feels like a pretty good way to wrap up this deep dive. It's like coming full circle, isn't it? Finding that inner peace no matter what's happening around us. It really is. And you know, the beauty of Aurelius's meditations is that it's not a one-time read. You can return to it again and again throughout your life and you'll find new insights, new layers of meaning each time. It's a lifelong companion on the journey of understanding yourself and your place in the world. Well, you've definitely inspired me to revisit meditations with fresh eyes. Thanks for taking this deep dive with me. My pleasure. Until next time, remember to embrace those moments of quiet reflection. And who knows, you might even channel your inner room. In the sky called life, we hold our heads high. Through the stormy skies, we never say die. Facing every challenge like a stoic night. With every step forward, we ignite the night.
bounce back from the falls, never showing no fear. In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear. With a heart of iron and a steady aim, we charge through the pain, never seeking fame. Keep it moving, keep it strong. Push it forward all day long. Slow and courage, battle on. Raise your voice and sing this song. From the valleys low to the highest peaks We conquer the silence even when it speaks Life's battles rage on, we never shy away Standing firm in the fray each and every day Rhythm of resilience pounding in our chest Fighting every battle, never taking rest Stoic courage flowing in our veins Through the joy and through the pains Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Slow and courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Bounce back from the falls, never showing no fear In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear With a heart of iron and a steady aim We charge through the pain, never seeking fame Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage, battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Keep it moving, keep it strong Forward all day long So we courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Do not pursue the taste of good food We live in a generation where a man's belly is his God And the words of his mouth precede his destruction Do not allow your belly to be your God Watch the words that you speak for your words determine your future do not fear death and never stray away from the way I am not interested with your talk about my ideas I am more interested in you applying them to your life if you do not then you are essentially not in accord with your own mind you must dispense with the notion that conversation will change your life. It is only strategy, plan, and execution that alters the very fabric of our existence. You must decide in this moment to execute like you never have. Execute in the face of adversity. Execute in the presence of doubt and fear. Execute. Get the job done. After you have spoken, take action. For if you remain still, you open the door to an idle mind. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Take full responsibility of the portrait and the picture of your life. For it is a direct result of the decisions you have made. The true meaning of the samurai is one who served... Do not rush the process. Trust it. Great things take time. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness. That is life. Let go of attachments and desires, and you will find peace. Buddha Resilience is knowing that you are the only one that has the power and the responsibility to pick yourself up. Sometimes a hypocrite is nothing more than a man in the process of changing. You are the self, the one without a second, Papaji.
how magnanimity is consistent with care. Things themselves are indifferent, but the use of them is not indifferent. How then shall a man preserve firmness and tranquility, and at the same time be careful and neither rash nor negligent, if he imitates those who play at dice? The counters are indifferent, the dice are indifferent. How do I know what the cast will be? But to use carefully and dexterously the cast of the dice, this is my business. Thus in life also the chief business is this. Distinguish and separate things and say, externals are not in my power. Will is in my power. Where shall I seek the good and the bad? Within in the things which are my own. But in what does not belong to you, call nothing either good or bad, or profit or damage or anything of the kind. What then? Should we use such things carelessly? In no way. For this, on the other hand, is bad for the faculty of the will, and consequently against nature. But we should act carefully, because the use is not indifferent, and we should also act with firmness and freedom from perturbations, because the material is indifferent. For where the material is not indifferent, there no man can hinder me, nor compel me. Where I can be hindered and compelled, the obtaining of those things is not in my power, nor is it good or bad. But the use is either bad or good, and the use is in my power. But it is difficult to mingle and to bring together these two things. The carefulness of him who is affected by the matter, and the firmness of him who has no regard for it. But it is not impossible, and if it is, happiness is impossible. But we should act as we do in the case of a voyage. What can I do? I can choose the master of the ship, the sailors, the day, the opportunity. Then comes a storm. What more have I to care for? For my part is done. The business belongs to another, the master, but the ship is sinking. What then have I to do? I do the only things that I can, not to be drowned full of fear nor screaming nor blaming God, but knowing that what has been produced must also perish. For I am not an immortal being, but a man, a part of the whole, as an hour is a part of the day. I must be present like the hour, and past like the hour. What difference then does it make to me how I pass away, whether by being suffocated or by a fever, for I must pass through some such means. This is just what you will see those doing who play at ball skillfully. No one cares about the ball being good or bad, but about throwing and catching it. In this, therefore, is the skill, this the art, the quickness, the judgment, so that if I spread out my lap, I may not be able to catch it, and another, if I throw, may catch the ball. But if with perturbation and fear we receive or throw the ball, what kind of play is it then? And wherein shall a man be steady? And how shall a man see the order in the game? But one will say, throw, or do not throw. And another will say, you have thrown once. This is quarreling, not play. Socrates then knew how to play at ball. How? By using pleasantry in the court where he was tried. Tell me, he says. Anitus, how do you say that I do not believe in God? The demons, who are they, think you? Are they not sons of gods, or compounded of gods and men? When Anitus admitted this, Socrates said, Who then, think you, can believe that there are mules but not asses? And this he said, as if he were playing at ball. And what was the ball in that case? Life, chains, banishment a draft of poison, separation from wife, and leaving children orphans. These were the things with which he was playing. But still he did play and threw the ball skillfully. So we should do. We must employ all the care of the players, but show the same indifference about the ball. For we ought by all means to apply our art to some external material not as valuing the material, but whatever it may be, showing our art in it. 
Thus, too, the weaver does not make wool, but exercises his art upon such as he receives. Another gives you food and property and is able to take them away, and your poor body also. When then you have received the material, work on it. If then you come out without having suffered anything, all who meet you will congratulate you on your escape. But he who knows how to look at such things, if he shall see that you have behaved properly in the matter, will commend you and be pleased with you. And if he shall find that you owe your escape to any want of proper behavior, he will do the contrary. For where rejoicing is reasonable, there also is congratulation reasonable. How then is it said that some external things are according to nature and others contrary to nature? It is said as it might be said if we were separated from union. For to the foot I shall say that it is according to nature for it to be clean. But if you take it as a foot and as a thing not detached, it will be fitted both to step into the mud and tread on thorns, and sometimes to be cut off for the benefit of the whole body. Otherwise it is no longer a foot. We should think in some way about ourselves also. What are you? A man. If you consider yourself as detached from other men, it is according to nature to live to old age, to be rich, to be healthy. But if you consider yourself as a man and a part of a certain whole, it is for the sake of that whole that at one time you should be sick, at another time take a voyage and run into danger, and at another time be in want.